Rapid onset gender dysphoria. Familiar with gender dysphoria, I'm sure. You're familiar with that. But what is it when it's rapid onset? What is that? It's a fake diagnosis, just to be clear, right out the gate. The idea of rapid onset gender dysphoria was basically birthed among these groups of parents who were struggling with their trans children having come out. Sometimes those are like trans children who are minors, and sometimes it, it's, it's like they're adult children. And these parents were like, oh my God, there were no signs. You know, this social contagion thing, it like, you know, oh, all of their friends came out as trans and then they, and then my kid came out as trans. So they see it as being trans is not really a real thing, or maybe some of them believe, okay, yes, it's a real thing, but only for a vanishingly small minority. And for most people, it's just, they just think it's cool and it's a fad they're getting caught up in. And they have like all the research on rapid, rapid onset gender dysphoria that supports the idea is in some way methodologically flawed. Like for example, one of the main studies is in support of rapid onset gender dysphoria was like based on survey from the adult parents, I guess saying adult in that context is kind of redundant, but the parents of trans kids who some of whom were like their adult children. And so it's the adults who are not privy to all the private information in the trans person's life and in their mind saying from the outside, okay, no, I for sure, like my kid for sure didn't show any signs until they were, you know, suddenly all of their friends came out as trans and then they got caught up in it, which is obviously pretty frustrating for a lot of trans people who are sitting there going, so you mean when I used to, like that one time when I dressed up in my mom's heels and I got like in trouble for it, you mean, what do you mean there were no signs that I was trans when I was a kid? That can be quite trying because for, yeah, parents for some reason have amnesia <laughs> about the signs that their kids were showing when they were younger. They're like, it's just, they're gaslighting themselves. I don't really know what the problem is. Hey, real quick, hit the like button if you're enjoying the content. Hit the subscribe button as well and turn on all notifications. And also take a moment to check out the links in the description for merchandise and Patreon where you can find exclusive free content. They can't even say what those signs are supposed to be. Well, yeah, Darth Gently, the problem as, the, as always is what are the signs as a cis person thinks they should look? You know, what it's like, you know, oh, did you show any signs? The kind of stuff that they think to look for are not necessarily reflective of what trans people actually do. Like if you have a kid who refuses to shower, most adults probably wouldn't think, oh, my kid has gender dysphoria. They'd probably think, oh, my kid's being obstinate. They are lazy. They just don't want to. Or maybe if the parent is charitable, they might be like, oh, my kid is apparently struggling with maybe some depression or maybe they're being bullied at school. People don't usually think the kid is not showering because they have gender dysphoria. So like, you know, you have to perform a specific kind of expression or suffering that cis people will identify as legitimate gender dysphoria. So even if you did like, so, you know, let's say you could have the kind of example of a kid who did show signs when they were younger, but either they were assigned female and so tomboyishness was not particularly punished or they were assigned male and were being punished for it. And then the parents are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Or lots of kids have signs that any trans person could look at and go, yeah, that is a trans teenager who's depressed because they haven't figured their shit out yet. Um, but a cisgender adult is gonna look at that and, you know, come up with a number of other explanations. And, you know, the fact that it, it's so frustrating that, you know, you can be a trans adult and be able to recognize these things in a trans kid. And the cis adults who refuse to see it as such will try to say that you're that you're causing some problem by pointing it out for what it is. So, you know, if anything, that's <laughs> Like egg prime directive is like leave people alone because of that, like that dynamic. But yeah, if you're not suffering unbearably, you don't deserve to do what will make you happy. Cis people with no concept of gender euphoria. Biggest sign of trans femme egg is long hair and leather jacket. Oh yeah. And like, 
a denial beard if they can manage if they can manage it. I so wished when I found out anyone would have simply told me about it before, but no one said a thing. Yeah, it's frustrating. Gender euphoria is what affirmed my gender. Yeah. So anyway, all that being said, there is more research going into the topic of rapid onset gender dysphoria. Maybe not even maybe not even like specifically for that, but you know, research is still being done on transition rates and you know, we pull this out all the time. The history of left-handedness, you know, you were, it was being actively suppressed and punished because of being allegedly devil-related. And then when you stop doing that, the number shoots up dramatically. And then, oh my God, suddenly we have like three times as, look at that, 4% and then up to 12%. There's three times as much left-handedness. Oh my God, devil worship is off the charts. And then it levels out. So actually what we're going to be reading about today is that numbers for trans people are leveling out. So it's, you know, the rapid onset gender dysphoria thing is, it, it's part of the broader conversation where these people like to say that being trans is this newfangled thing. It's this brand new fad. All these people are going to end up regretting it. And it just doesn't end up, it doesn't end up looking like that most of the time. It's exploding in popularity or whatever because we're not actively suppressing it as much there's still plenty of active you know suppression and hatred toward trans people and we're experiencing a backlash of that right now but yeah mainly we're seeing this increase temporarily as a societal shift happens where people who pray probably formerly would have just felt weird and depressed their whole life and been unsure what the reason was and then they would have died in obscurity. Instead, those people are like, oh, I see a trans person not being hate crimed in public. Wow, I could be that. I guess that's what is wrong with me. And then the depression and everything goes away and they don't die like dejected and alone. Um, so increasing rates of acceptance are increasing, quote, the rate of transition, but it's gonna level out and it is starting to level out. Also, even if it was exploding in popularity, I'm gonna need transphobes to have an actual valid reason for that to be a bad thing. I mean, they're basically just terrified of gender, but they want to inflict that on trans people and like to protect all cis people from ever potentially having a regretful trans experience. My grandmother raised me and tried to force me to write with my right hand until my kindergarten teacher told her she was hurting my development. People are still crazy. I have an aunt who was forced to write with her right hand in the 60s there. Yeah, and all, of course, compared to the left-handed thing, yeah, punishing your trans child also is going to set their development back. But yeah, so so basically, you know, obviously Aaron is agreeing, you know, the apparent increase in trans individuals is likely attributable to the removal of the negative barriers. This study shows that we may be seeing the stabilization now, basically like graphs showing the rate of individuals in these different age groups. So... You know, the number of very old people in this, in like very old people who are trans remains pretty low on that yellow line. <sighs> I don't know if this is friendly to colorblind people, but yeah. So we're seeing, oh look, right here, transgender men, diagnosis of gender dysphoria. There was a spike in 2018 and it's starting to come back down a little bit um, among young people, ages like 15 to 19. Oh, these are two different things. The diagnosis up here. This is the rate of diagnosis of gender dysphoria, and this is the rate down here of legal sex change, I believe. Yeah, we're basically, so we saw like a sharp increase around 2016 for both groups. Transgender women diagnosis did not go up as dramatically, but their rate of diagnosis was already fairly high. And of course, like any increase looks high if you're like l looking at really low percentages. Or is this a percentage? Oh, it's just a rate, like per capita, which makes it a little bit harder to compare. Um, hmm, I'm not sure exactly what, what rate means in this context. But basically what we're showing is a sharp increase around a time when there was a social acceptance occurring. And then that rate has leveled off a little bit or like dropping slightly and then it's going to start leveling off. Yeah, true. The more the more that trans people are accepted worldwide, the more comfortable they are to come out and transition. <gasps> Surprise! It's up 12,000% from one person to 13 people. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Yeah, like, yeah. 
if the current rate is 2% and it goes up to 4%, then that's like, oh my God, it doubled. But it's like, okay, a 2% increase, like, and, and I'm just making up numbers. That's, that's a, that's a dramatic increase. Um, <laughs> like, but yeah, also, yeah, like detransition isn't inherently bad. That's the other thing about the whole, like, trying to prevent regret aspect of this. So there are a couple of caveats in this study to, you know, just focus on. So the study is focusing primarily on gender marker changes and diagnoses of dysphoria, which are both like things that not every trans person has access to. Not every trans person gets a diagnosis, can afford a diagnosis, can afford to do the legal gender marker change, like even has permission to do a gender marker change. Yeah. Secondly, the study is examining Sweden, where the barriers to accessing care are different from those in the United States. So the stabilization rates in both countries can vary as the populations respond to different barriers. So yeah, some some trans people are not seeking access to medical care and um, everything like this. So there are some things to keep, you know, a grain of salt in mind uh, or whatever. But for the most part, we're basically seeing Yes, there was a temporary increase and then it's leveling off, which is what we predicted. This is how you actually do science, everybody. You have a prediction and then you see what happens and like, and does the, does what occurs in your experiment or with the data, does it match your prediction? Like, yeah, because we are already familiar with this concept, again, the history of left-handedness, like, yeah, if you just stop actively preventing people from being left-handed, or in this case, if you stop actively preventing people from being trans, there is always going to be, okay, yeah, seems like there's a sudden dramatic increase, and then it's just going to level off. Because the number of left-handed people is stable in the population, and the number of trans people would probably be relatively stable in the population if we could just allow them to be people. Because it's like hard statistically to look at this like historical data on account of we basically haven't had a time in recent history where we aren't actively suppressing trans people. So it's like hard to get data on what the prevalence actually is in society. I used to be scared I would regret transitioning and I don't, but I also now at this point don't understand why so much fear is even built around it. It's just a different experience in life. That's cool. Yeah. Also, as a former public health stati statistician, I have been shouting these points for years. It is going to level off and then we can level off better healthcare in an ideal world. Of course, people are dumb. Stop actively persecuting trans people. Challenge 2024. Can we do it? For people worried about detransitioners, wouldn't letting people try all the reversible stuff as freely and comfortably as they want be an easy thing to advocate for? No, because we've seen that when we, you know, when we restrict and gatekeep things the way that we are now, the majority of people who start the reversible stuff, like hormone blockers, for example, then go on to usually get cross-sex hormones and HRT. So they also oppose starting on puberty blockers because they view, they're like, this is starting them on a path and they won't come off of it. And they're, it's part of the reason why they're advocating against trans sports access is like, oh, well, these kids, they have to, they have to medically transition in order to do the sports. And if they start the medical transition, then they might not stop. They might not switch back. I'm like, yeah, so they're just, they just want people to stop being trans. I've been accused of being, quote, addicted to estrogen. Do not, my friends, become addicted to water. That's that's what that sounds like to me. I haven't seen that movie, but that is what it sounds like. A phrase I don't hear regularly enough is, there are three types of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. The misuse of technically correct statistics can be used a lot more maliciously than an outright lie. Yeah, we're experiencing that a lot with this whole anti-trans backlash. People are just willing to misuse data. And frankly, they're just willing, willing to make up data. You know, the, the 80 study is all methodologically flawed and all that, but they also don't care even about sticking to that number because people will allude to the 80% and then they'll just start throwing out other numbers. They'll be like, oh, 95% of these people end up going back anyway. Like... They don't actually about the statistical accuracy. It's just a way for them to be manipulative. The 80% study didn't even claim 80%. It was like 64. Well, they ended up counting the ones who simply stopped going or stopped responding to the study. 
um, they counted those as people who desisted from being trans and instead of just being like folks who stopped participating in the study. So that's part of the reason why the number is so wrong. Best number is the number of major medicals that subscribe to the gender affirming model, but they usually don't, they're like, oh, those are all ideologically influenced and you know, those, those people can't be trusted. They're in the pockets of big pharma. And then <laughs> meanwhile, the organizations that they reference for their statistics are like, you know, organizations that deliberately name themselves something similar to a more prestigious organization in order to obfuscate the fact that they don't do any actual research. Was that the study where they counted children who play with other gendered toys as potential trans who resolved when growing up? I think maybe, I don't know, it was some really, like numerous things about that study were overblown. I went back to that 80% study and double checked, 22% couldn't be contacted, 41% desisted, 37% uh, continued. So there was 63% who allegedly desisted or who couldn't be counted, basically. No worries, but thanks for going back and checking. Hi, thank you so much to all of my patrons, especially Diago Nascimento, Mersh Rolvog, Amanda B, Michelle Frateroli, Michelle Winter, Wellington Marcus, Danielle McDonald, DZXN, Suzanne Maynard, Spooky Heather Sylvia, Jamie Jam, Pastnell Infinity, Nova, Elizabeth Bartell, Sojo, Sarah A, Athiet, Kevin Young, Celeste, Desi Quiche, Liam Hodgson, Mr. Atheist, and Ella V. Nobody.